This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire, and on today's program, we're going to continue to talk about, expose the great spiritual battle behind uh, what appears to be a coup to remove the current president of the United States, Donald Trump, from office by a variety of means. Now, why this is uh, extremely alarming and disturbing is that we have never seen this uh, to this degree in the history of the United States. We have seen presidents deposed uh, through, through questionable means. We have seen presidents assassinated with many questions asked. But here we have a president, Donald Trump, who has been under an all-out assault on a scale never known before in the history of the United States and perhaps the world, if you add the influence of the media into it. Never, see, Donald Trump identifies himself and clarifies himself regarding who he is and what he really stands for by the fact that you can look at who his enemies are and it gives you an idea who he is. Now, this is very, very important. Unfortunately, a lot of people on the left and liberals, uh, they don't do that. And my goal here on the program is not to be partisan or political, because the same dynamics that are at play now, and this is what I don't understand, uh, it baffles me, the irrationality of, of, of many, the same dynamics that are at work now in an all-out effort to depose or uh, initiate a coup against Trump, those same dynamics could be used against a liberal uh, democratic politician. I mean, once you set the precedent for removing any president you particularly don't like or your group doesn't like from office illegally, you have participated in the absolute destruction of America as a free society. And, and the amount of naiveness that goes into this is, is mind-blowing. I mean, it's not naivete on the part of the elite. They know exactly what's happening, and they're pulling the strings from behind the scenes. But the masses, and that would include the so-called educated masses, who hardly act educated, they are participating in this coup by their either their silence in not protesting it or their cheering it on, and they fail to recognize that once you set this precedent, and, and let's outline the precedent in very clear terms. What you are saying by this coup is that if a president of the United States is legally and constitutionally elected into the office of president, but a particular group or a collection of groups or a particular political party does not happen to like what this president stands for, then those groups have the illegal right to remove him from office illegally by any means necessary, simply because they don't agree with his policies and what he stands for. With one snap of your fingers, you've, th you've thrown America into an, an anarchistic nation with no laws, with no, with no uh, election of candidates, and you've turned America into a totalitarian state. And yet the people that are driving, driving this thing are, are so inflamed by the lust for personal power or the lust that their ideology would pre prevail that they can't think straight, straight. You know, it reminds me of the dynamics that occurred during the French Revolution. Because many of these same dynamics that are playing out before our, our eyes um, ha have happened in history. And those that know history are not doomed to repeat it. Unfortunately, most Americans, and especially most American Christians, know nothing of history, and they are doomed to repeat it. The American Revolution was based on the Bible-believing Christian principles of our founding fathers. Now, by our founding fathers, I include, most importantly, 
the Bible-believing pilgrims and Puritans who established America in the 1600s and who were not only born again, they were heavy-duty, serious students of the Scripture, and they were brilliant men and women. Their educational level is so far beyond the educational level of of those that would call themselves professors in our Ivy League colleges. It's, It's just staggering. I mean, the average pastor knew the Bible backwards and forwards, and he could uh, interpret from Latin or Greek or Hebrew. Uh, The fluency in philosophy and sciences was just astronomical. These people were very smart people because they were not the product of public education, which is designed to scientifically dumb you down. And so they infused America with a biblical foundation, And many of our founding fathers, who were not Christians, attended the colleges, the universities that were set up by the Pilgrims and Puritans. You take a lot of the Ivy League schools in America. Now think about how tragic this is. Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and so many others. Those schools were established by fervent Bible-believing Christians for the purpose of developing ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ who would be equipped intellectually, spiritually, and biblically to preach the gospel and to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was the original purpose for the founding of many of these Ivy League universities. You really have to understand that. They, They were training men in preparation for the ministry, and they completely believed in the Bible, okay? I'm talking about the major Ivy League schools in our nation. And the quality of the education was so outstanding on both an intellectual level as well as a theological level that even those uh, men who were not necessarily from Christian homes they would study and attend and graduate from these Christian schools. I'm talking about many of our founding fathers and first presidents, etc., attended these Pilgrim and Puritan schools because of their excellence, and they trained them in a biblical worldview. So even if these men later on did not, quote, technically become Christians, they were embedded with a biblical worldview, and that biblical worldview ended up being placed in the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. So America, unlike all the other nations, was founded on the Bible and a biblical worldview. Now, to show you the degradation and the deterioration and the destruction that has been unleashed upon America over the last 200 plus years, all we have to do is look at these same exact Ivy League schools like Yale, Harvard, Princeton, and others. And what do we see? These schools are not only not dedicated to training people in biblical Christianity and theology or ministry. They're not only not dedicated to that, they are dedicated to the opposite. They are dedicated. These once uh, pilgrim Puritan schools that were Uh, designed from their inception, like Harvard and Yale and Princeton, to equip men to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. These same institutions, which we call Ivy League schools, are completely dedicated to the destruction and eradication of Christianity and all forms of Christianity in our nation. It's a 180-degree turn. They have become the enemies of Christ, via embracing a godless Marxist socialism, which is energized by a spirit of Antichrist. So what they graduate is men and women who are trained to be militantly opposed to Christianity and a biblical worldview and Jesus Christ himself. That happened because God's people failed to occupy the land like they were intended to do. So now we see this, this coup in America. And this, this, this hidden control system has been in place for a long, long time. I mean, mm-hmm. this, this shadow government, this secret 
invisible government and all that stuff. That, that, that just didn't, you know, materialize yesterday, crying out loud. That's been going on for a long, at least 100 years, since the beginning of America, after a period after the Founding Fathers, probably beginning around the time of Abraham Lincoln, it started to be infiltrated by the international bankers who secretly run America from the confines of the city of London, a separate city inside the city of London, where the Rothschilds and the international bankers run the world. And by the way, Great Britain is the center, the global center of Satanism as well. So this is what we're up against. We have a, a, a government that wants to expunge, expel, in their own words, kill, assassinate. Their other strategy is to, to manufacture all kinds of lies to declare him mentally unfit. That's going to be a big one. Watch for that very carefully. And they want to get rid of President Trump by any means necessary. And apparently one of his top leaders, I shouldn't say leaders, one of his top people that he put in charge, that he made the gatekeeper uh, of his administration, if the reports are true, which they appear to be, this guy is a, a George Soros operative. He's been trained by George Soros. According to one report that I read today, uh, he c gives George Soros a daily update on his activities. This is, <laughs> this is the man that Trump has entrusted to, to watch his back. Now, clearly, we have a problem here. We have an endless series of attacks in the media. We have an endless series of completely bogus investigations, such as the Russian collusion. And this mental fitness thing is going to be, it's going to be ramped up. We have, uh, it appears that uh, Jeff Sessions, people are saying he's compromised, which would make sense. Because how could a man who had that political philosophy end up being not only a failure uh, for Trump, but one of the key agents that is allowing an onslaught of attacks against Trump. So I don't know personally what the story is with Jeff Sessions, but the man should never, the man should have, been forthcoming with Trump in the interview because he was probably compromised way back. And, and if he's compromised, he's capable of doing nothing. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's such an odd series of, of events. And I think that Trump is caught off guard because he's used to working in a corporate environment. And now he's seeing this is a different jungle that Donald Trump has entered into, the jungle of bureaucracies and monolithic power from unelected officials. So a bottom line here, though, the bottom line through it all is this. Trump's policies, what Trump has done, is in direct opposition to the globalists who have been running America and are running the world. They don't like him because he's not one of them, despite what some Christians fantasize, you're, you're completely wrong. If he was one of them, they would like him. It's obvious he's not one of them, and that's why they don't like him. He is for the things um, that the American people are for, the middle class and the working class. He is a patriot. He believes in America. He believes in nationalism. He, he, he is against the trade treaties because he knows the trade treaties contain secret language designed to destroy the United States of America as an independent sovereign nation. Did you hear what I just said? The, the reason they kept saying over and over again, well, you can't read the trade treaties until you sign it, which is like, like, why did the American people ever accept that? Why did the American people ever, I mean, for crying out loud, naive is being kind. And anybody, and I don't believe for a moment that the, the politicians on the left and the right, the Democrats and the Republicans, 
none of them are that stupid. If anything, they they may not they may not be brilliant men and women, but they know they are cunning and they know how to survive. And they certainly knew that that by playing the game, see, it's a game. Wink, wink. The, the, the Democrats wink at the Republicans. The Republicans wink at the Democrats because they're on the same team. Wink, wink, while they fool the American people. This has been going on a long time. They wink at each other. They're in agreement. Because you see, okay, so a Democrat takes the heat under the Obama administration. I think it was Pelosi who actually came out and said that you can't read the trade treaty till... And I think that was probably the Obama, Obamacare health bill, that you can't read it till you sign it. And I don't remember who it was that came forward with the trade treaty, which also said you can't read it till you sign it. Now, um, we get outraged, but we have to remember that is not a, a Democrat problem. That's equally a Republican problem. It's a game they play. So the agreement is, okay, a Democratic leader will take the heat of saying that because that that statement is more palatable to the Democratic Party's constituents than it is to the Republican Party's constituents. But meanwhile, in secret, both the Republicans, most of them, and both the Democrats are fully on board with it. And they actually want to be told publicly that they can't read the contract. Do you understand that? They want to be told publicly they can't read the contract. And despite their fake protests and their fake, uh, you know, uh, denunciations of it, it, it's a good thing for them. Because then, when the traitorous language that is inside of the trade treaty comes to light, they can't be blamed because, after all, well, I wasn't allowed to read it. See, they don't want to read it because if they read it, they could be held accountable down the line when the contents become public. It's a game. This way, they got their you-know-what covered so that when the trade treaty comes to light, they don't get blamed. When people start to see, see the secret language of the trade treaty, when an organization like WikiLeaks or some other organization releases the contents of the trade treaties, and you see that the trade treaties are far for more than just about trade between the various nations, that the trade treaties are really a legal instrument to, to bring down the United States of America as an independent constitutional sovereign nation and make it a North American Union, which is a regional global government, along with the European Union, another regional global government, and fit it neatly into the auspices of a United Nations global government. That's really what's in the trade treaty. It's a stripping of your constitutional rights, your Bill of Rights, your uh, Declaration of Independence, and your, uh, your freedoms. See, that's what it's really about. Now you say, well, how do you know that? Well, I'll tell you how I know it. I'll tell you how I know it. I actually take the time to study history. And since I take the time to study history, this uh, strategy with trade treaties is, is very recent. Because the same people who are the architects of the trade treaties involving Obama and the Republicans and Democrats are the same people the globalists were ultimately behind their European Union trade treaties. But you know what? The price of freedom is an eternal vigilance. And in order to be eternally vigilant, you have to be self-educated and aware. Knowledge is power. If you insist upon being ignorant, you will be a slave. And God did not call his people to be slaves. Let me remind you of that. Let me remind you of something about America. You have an obligation before Almighty God to get your head straight theologically and in terms of what the Bible actually says versus what you think it says versus what somebody told you it says, you have an obligation before your Lord and Master Jesus Christ to rightly divide the Word of God and not come up with some completely ridiculous interpretation of Bible prophecy based on having a bent antenna. Ideas have consequences. 
bad or good. Theology has consequences, bad or good. And the actions and choices we make, we, we've now approached the point of no return. So we no longer can afford to play games. We have to get it right. We have to make the right decisions. And we have to move forward in the right direction because we are out of time. So what are you saying, Paul? This is what I'm saying. Forget about all the postulations and theories and opinions uh, regarding uh, all this stuff regarding the tribulation period. I'm not saying it isn't important to study it. Don't get me wrong. You should study it. But you should study it in context. Let me, let me share two things. Number one, I am not advocating, and nor did I ever advocate. Um, I believe that the prophetic scriptures will come true exactly as God wrote them down in his holy word. I believe all of uh, the word of God is true. And it's without error. I believe that all of God's prophecies will come true exactly as he predicted them. But I believe exactly as he predicted them, not exactly how you misinterpreted them. There's a big difference. Now, clearly, we are not yet in the tri seven-year tribulation period. Therefore, we are in some kind of interim period. You can. I'm not interested in arguing with you about what you want to call the interim period. If you're upset with the word reprieve, so what? Get another word. The point is, it's obvious we're in some kind of reprieve. If you don't like the word reprieve? Get a thesaurus and find a different word. Because we still have a limited window of opportunity to preach the gospel, to occupy until Jesus Christ comes and make disciples of all nations. That opportunity is available to us now. If the opportunity was not available to us now, then very well we might be in a different prophetic uh, time sequence, such as the tribulation, where either if you're here, either you accept the mark of the beast or you're beheaded. Now we're in an entirely different scenario. You can't preach the gospel. You can't occupy until he comes, and you can't make disciples of all nations. But we haven't arrived there yet. We have a responsibility to occupy the land, and to obey Jesus Christ regarding what he commanded us to do in his word, instead of inserting our opinions in things and then uh, substituting God's marching orders for, for personal opinions. The, the rule from our supreme commander, Jesus Christ, is that we go into all the world and preach the gospel, which means win souls for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ told us that we are to make disciples of all nations. And Jesus Christ told us we are to occupy the land until he comes. So that's what we should be about now. Because that is the door that is open before us. Notice that the door is not closed. Notice that the opportunity to do, to do that is directly connected to America. I mean, this is like a no-brainer. It's called... You know, reading history, reading the scripture, observing reality, connecting them together, and executing a plan based on God's word. Not, not very difficult. So, because we have a unique constitution and a bill of rights, and it is unique, it's different than any other nation on planet Earth, for this very reason, it is established on this foundational truth which sets it apart from the so-called uh, rights of other nations, which are not rights at all. Our rights are given to us by God, not by a government. And that's what makes America different in every way, shape, or form. America is founded on the eternal truth that it is God and God alone that gives us our rights. No other document says that. That is why American exceptionalism is real, among one of many reasons. So in the Declaration of Independence, which I'm holding in my hand, I want to read you something that you're familiar with, but you need to 
we all need to refresh our memory over and over again because you will never see the words of the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution or the Bill of Rights spoken of. Usually it's hidden. It's not talked about in schools. The media blabs over it. But just reading it from the Declaration of Independence itself, for example, is powerful enough. But you see, the document that I'm holding in my hand, and right now I'm holding the Declaration of Independence in Congress, July 4th, 1776. This document is so powerful that they will do anything to destroy it. That's why the Soros-funded groups and the others, they're doing everything they can to dumb down your children, rob it from your mind, bury it. And then you have some complete... Uh, I'm refraining from what I really want to say. You have somebody like uh, Al Gore who calls the Constitution an evolving document. And my question to Al Gore is, where in the Constitution does it say it's an evolving document? It doesn't. So, Mr. Gore, you don't have the legal or constitutional right to add something into the Constitution that doesn't exist. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say it's an evolving document. You added that on like a slippery used car salesman so you could cheat your customer. That's why you added it in there, so you could switch it. And that's why your elite friends keep calling uh, the Constitution an evolving document, because they, they have the same spirit you have, the spirit of your father, who's the father of lies twisting and perverting. You know who you are, and you know who you serve. So, let's read the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their Creator, capital C, with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers, not their unjust powers, from the consent of the governed, and that when any, whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute a new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So you see what the Founding Fathers said. Now my question to you is, what makes the American, our rights different, is they're given by God and they cannot be taken away by man or man's government. And then our founding fathers said that any government, such as our government, and think of these, think of these fraudulent investigations going on in Washington, D.C. Think of the fraudulent investigations. And I say fraudulent because they're, trying to, they're, tr they're attempting to impeach a man based on lies, at the same time violating the uh, the Constitution. They are accusing him of uh, they are accusing him of collusion with the Russians, and they are proceeding with an investigation based on the fact that he's guilty, when they have not yet produced any documented evidence of guilt. Therefore, it, it should be presumed that he's innocent, because they haven't come up with anything that says he's guilty. But they keep they keep uh, proceeding forward, and his uh, his his prosecutors, his henchmen, 
they are hardly impartial. They are allied with the enemies of the present, with a different ideology and a different philosophy. This is not an impartial, uh, fair investigation. This is a lynching mob. And it should be obvious to you what's happening right before your very eyes. So, we read in this founding document these words. That governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers. See, our founding fathers are saying the only power that government has is the power that the people give it and that it, their power must be just. When, they, you, when, when any government becomes unjust and commits injustice, it is illegitimate. That's what the Founding Fathers are saying. And what, is, what do the Founding Fathers also say? That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. That's what the Founding Fathers said. Now, we read further that the president of the United States, in our case, the president is Donald Trump, he was legally elected according to the Constitution. Therefore, he is our legally elected and constitutionally elected president of the United States. But because there is a certain percentage of people in the United States that, that does not like what he stands for, and in fact, it's, it's not even that large of a percentage, the reality is the percentage that does exist that disagrees with the policies of Donald Trump has largely been inflamed and magnified due to outside influences outside of the U.S. government, outside of we the people, and outside of the United States. So we have billionaires who are financing uh, a coup because the globalist elite, of which they're part of and which they represent, which are uh, foreign interests because they're headquartered in London and other places, international banking families with vast wealth, and the globalists. It is the globalists that don't like what Trump is doing. The same thing in the European Union. The globalists are propping up all these uh, very unpopular prime ministers and very unpopular leaders throughout Europe. These leaders could never get elected without the massive power and money and media control of the globalist elite behind the scenes. What kind of European in their right mind would allow their borders to be wide open, allowing in massive numbers of militant extremist Islamic males with an ideology towards jihad who are raping European women, attacking Jews, and basically destroying their culture. The European people don't want that, but they can't do anything about that because the power of the globalists economically and the way they control the media, they, they overrule the, the common people of Europe, just like they're trying to take Brexit, which the people of Britain legally voted to leave the European Union. Why? Because the European Union is this wonderful organization? No. The European Union is very much like the United Nations. It's not a wonderful organization. It's a totalitarian government. It has yet to show its fangs. But believe me, should the Lord tarry, you will see the government of the European Union show its fangs. Just read Daniel, the prophet Daniel in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, and read about the revived Roman Empire that arises basically in Europe and read about what that revived Roman Empire does and who comes to power to head up the revived Roman Empire. Then you'll see the fangs come out from the revived Roman Empire of the European Union. Do you think it's an accident that the occult elite, and yes, they're deeply involved in the occult and Luciferianism, I hate to break it to you. I hate to break it to you. Knowledge is power. I know you've been hanging around with a lot of seeker-friendly kumbaya Christians, and this is like... Really tough sledding, I know, I understand that. But it's time to grow up. Because 
you're about to face your destiny. And if you don't wake up soon, it's going to be too late. I'm not saying this in arrogance. I'm saying it in loving confrontation because I believe that true love confronts and true love does not, not appease. As a father who raised three children, and my daughter stepped out into the street, at the, you know, where the cars can come by, and she was like three years old. I grabbed her by the hand, jolted her, told her what she was doing wrong, and swatted her firmly uh, in a place that was appropriate. And she knew that her father... She, I don't think she totally comprehended the danger of being hit by a car, but she she respected her father because her father exercised discipline and confrontation out of love, not out of abuse. See, true love confronts. If I didn't love my daughter, I would have not confronted. And then one day I could have woken up and saw her head splattered all over the pavement. Is that love? You say, why do you take such why are you taking such an extreme example? To me, it's not an extreme example. I grew up in a neighborhood where uh, one of my childhood uh, friends or associates, I shouldn't say associates, but one of the one of the young guys in the neighborhood like me, and I forgot his age, he was young. I think we're we're talking about around nine or ten years old, maybe younger, maybe eight or seven. And he disobeyed his parents. And he ran out across the street between, uh, between two parked cars. So an on oncoming car, which was speeding, could not see him because of his height. And then as he ran directly in front of the car, and they couldn't see him. Um, and they were going at way over the speed limit. They smashed into that young child, and I don't know what happened to him, but a fortune was spent on repairing and rebuilding his body. So I did not visually see it, but I heard the horror story of what happened. So you see, that experience of hearing about somebody that grew up in a, in a building, the same building that I lived in, his parents told him over and over again not to cr run into the street in front of an oncoming car. He paid a bitter consequence for it. So when I spoke to my daughter, you see, in the back of my mind is the memory of the destruction of a childhood friend. The plates, the metal plates put in his head, and I won't go into all the, the details. So what does a, a loving father do? Sit there with a daze in his eyes and, and doesn't know what's going on with this lethargic look? No, no. True love confronts. True love obeys the Spirit of the Lord when the Holy Spirit is calling a man in particular. When the Holy Spirit of Almighty God issues a call to a man of God, such as you listening, and you can sense the Holy Spirit calling in you. And you can sense the Holy Spirit reaching into your heart. And you can sense that it's not just the Holy Spirit calling you. You can sense and you know in your inner being that this is the Holy Spirit calling you. But you also know in your heart that the Holy Spirit is your King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is calling you. And that it is Jesus Christ himself that is calling you. And you, my male friend of whatever age, my brother in Christ, the Lord is calling you. And you have to weigh in your heart whether or not you're going to respond to this call of the Lord to truly be the man of God you were called to be and to truly step up to the plate in the time of greatest crisis. And my question to you as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ is, will you respond to that call? Now, let me remind you, to pretend you didn't hear the call, to delay responding, and to ignore it is the equivalent of saying no to the Lord. But there's no question in my mind that at this moment the Lord is calling men 
And he's calling you. And he's calling you through the medium of this program, the Paul McGuire Report, but he's calling men all over this nation through different ways. Some men are waking up in the middle of the night. Some men are being called, exercising or whatever, or driving to, to, to work. And the question is, of all the men that God calls, oh, wait, and it's many, it's many, it's millions upon millions of millions that the Lord is calling. How many among the millions and the millions will respond to the call of the Lord? You see, it's easy to call yourself a Christian and play all the games and do all that stuff. That's great. That's just showtime. But are you willing to answer the call of God? Because he is calling you. Why do you think you were created? I mean, let's do the math here. You were created for such a time as this. Or you wouldn't be here at this exact time zone. And God knew you before the foundation of the world. And he called you to be here in this time zone, to be here for such a time as this. What does that imply? Well, you know the answer. It implies you have been called to be here for such a time as this. And that means God is calling you to be something and to do something. Not just sit on your tush and watch television and, you know, have a beer or potato chips. And the, f the first call of God goes out to the man. Sorry, ladies, but it does. It goes out to the man. But then, because many men will not listen, like in the Bible, when God could not find a man, not because the woman is inferior in any way, God issues a call to, to the woman, to the women of God. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to the women of God. All over this nation, the Holy Spirit is calling the women of God. He's calling the women of God to, to respond to his call, to respond to the urgency of the moment. And the Lord is calling the women of God in a way that's similar to the call on the men of God. And he's calling them to stop playing church and to have a moratorium on some of the silliness and the and the precocious activities and the indulgent activities. Not that you can't have a good time. Not, not, not that you can't laugh. Not that you can't fellowship and enjoy life. God isn't saying that. But read Ecclesiastes. You've got to know what, what time you're in. There's a time for that and there's a time for this. And we're in a time where you need to, not you, all of us need to, Heed the call of the Lord because he is speaking to us. And how do you do that? We'll talk about it on the program. But the first thing you do, you do is you respond and, and say to the Lord, Lord, you vocalize it. You say, Lord, I am willing to respond to your call. I'm not sure what I should do. Show me, Lord. I surrender my life to you, Lord. Show me. I give myself to you, Lord. Take control of me more completely. And don't allow the devil to deceive you. And this goes to both men and women. <clears throat> Do not allow Satan and the evil one to deceive you. Because his primary weapon against the church has always been the same. It's found in Revelation chapter 12 where Satan is called the accuser of the brethren and, and the sisters, I would add, the accusers of God's men and women. And he accuses them day and night before the throne room of God. And what does Satan accuse God's people of day and night before the throne room of God? This is his primary weapon. Revelation 12, he accuses them and mentions to God every area in that man or woman's life where they have missed the mark, where they've sinned, where they've failed, where they, where they didn't do the right thing. Okay, that's what the devil accuses them about. And as such, now listen to me carefully, because as I speak, if you will listen, the power of the Holy Spirit will come down upon you and shatter that stronghold of bondage and break that, that iron 
metallic structure that's been erected over your heart and mind and ears in the invisible realm to blind you and deafen you from the truth of God's word. It's a satanic stronghold. And if you will listen, the power of the Lord ignited by the Holy Spirit will evaporate that metallic structure in a second. And you will hear and you will be set free by the truth of God's word. So the enemy's strategy is to render God's people powerless. So many of you who feel the call, who hear the call of the Holy Spirit, who want to respond, and I'm talking to you now, and you know that I'm talking to you, and when I say I'm talking to you, there's somebody else talking to you. You're hesitating because you feel unworthy. But I'm here to tell you that you're not unworthy. So there's no reason to hesitate because the one who is accusing you, number one, your sin or failings as a human being is none of his business. He is illegally intruding. Number two, he's a liar, and he's been a liar from the beginning. And he only has power over you to the degree that you believe his lies in the form of accusations. He can only immobilize you and paralyze you to the degree that you believe his lies and accusations. But when you believe the word of God, what God has said to you, then the sword of the Spirit appears in your hand and you can wield it mightily and decapitate the serpent's head who's attempting to paralyze you. How do we know that? Because in Revelation 12, in the verse immediately after, where it says that Satan accuses the men and women of God before the throne room day and night, it says in the verse afterwards, but they overcame him. Who's they? All believers in Jesus Christ, men and women. That's you. That's the good news. They overcame. We overcame. I overcame. You overcame. We overcame him. Who's him? Satan. How do we overcome him? By our good works? By our good intentions? By our constant promises to God that we'll, we'll, we, we won't sin again next time? By our constant efforts at willpower? By, by doing all these checklists of good works? Is that how we overcome the power of the devil? No. It says they. That's you and me and all true Christians. They, we, you, you listening now, you overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, which means you stood up as a man or woman of God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and you confronted the powers of darkness and the lies of the evil one, knowing the truth which sets you free, which is you confessed your sins to Jesus when you were born again. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you of all sin. In any sin that you have committed or continue to commit from that day forward, you simply ask God for forgiveness sincerely, and by faith you believe that Jesus Christ cleanses you of all sin. And so the fact is that because of Jesus Christ, you are cleansed of all sin by the blood of the Lamb and that your righteousness is a gift from God, not something that you earn. And therefore, you recognize that in the eyes of the only person that matters in the universe, which is the supreme judge of uh, the universe, Almighty God, he sees you, despite the devil's accusations, despite your own accusations against yourself, he sees you as pure and holy and clothed in the righteousness that is imparted to you by Christ Jesus because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you of all sin. And in that truth, the moment by the revelation of the Holy Spirit that you embrace that truth, you are electrified with the power of the Holy Spirit, and then it is said of you that they overcame him, who? Satan, by the, uh, uh, by the word of their testimony, Jesus saved me in the blood of the Lamb. That's you. So know, so know that, that because that's you, and God calls you, as he's calling you now, there's no reason to shirk or be embarrassed or ashamed by coming forward and answering God's call. 
because God sees you pure and holy. He sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses you of all sin. All sin. So you're free to respond to the call. You're not, you're not knocked out of the game. I don't know about you, man, but that's good news, you know? You're not, like, have, having to twist, uh, twist yourself in the shape of a pretzel to please the Lord. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report on Paul McGuire. This program, somebody you know needs to hear, and you need to listen to the Lord about who it is that he's putting on your heart and send this program to them. We have all kinds of social media links that they can play or watch it on any kind of media. You simply go to paulmcguire.us, paulmcguire.us, and you can send an archive of this program. By the way, we are holding a special Paradise Mountain Church meeting Thursday, August 24th, 7 p.m. sharp at Paradise Mountain Church International. And the title of the meeting is Asking God to Supernaturally Intervene in Our Nation. And it will be a time of prophetic teaching that's applicable to what's going on in our nation. It'll be a time of prayer and it'll be a time of ministry. And I believe the Holy Spirit is calling many of you to come. And also, um, we make room and time to pray for all those who want pray, prayer. And I will personally pray for every single person who uh, attends the meeting. And we have regularly seen the power of God moved in our midst in miraculous ways. And the presence of the Lord fill the room. And the power of God come down in the room. And we believe that as the anointing of the Lord is poured out upon his people, that God does answer our prayers. So it's, it's a time of friendship, fellowship. We don't judge people. We accept people. But it's a time where you will have a supernatural, a supernatural encounter with your Lord Jesus Christ. And you, you won't regret it. In addition, for those of you that God is calling to come, God will, he will bless you richly. So we give the directions uh, for the church meeting, the location, the hotel that we meet at regularly. Um, you must register. We don't give your information to anybody. You've got to register, but the event, of course, is free. And I'd love to meet you, and I'd love to see you there. Join us at Paradise Mountain Church International in North Hollywood, August 24th, Thursday. Be there. God's going to move powerfully as we ask him together. See, we're not just going to continue to look at what's happening on television and wring our hands and complain about it. We're going to ask God. We're going to believe God to supernaturally intervene. And as we ask God and believe God to supernaturally intervene, the power of heaven will come down and shake the power of earth. And you say, well, how can you be so assumptive to say that? I can be so assumptive to say that because all it takes is the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, which I don't have, by the way. I have the faith of a microscopic mustard seed. But that's all it takes to move mountains with God. With God. So on that basis, if I show up with a microscopic mustard seed of faith, I know that God will release his power in a mountain-moving way. I'm totally confident in that. If I had to come up with any more faith than that, I don't think anything would happen. I'd love to see you there. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. Visit paulmcguire.us. I'm Paul McGuire. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire, and we were talking about the need to engage well, first of all, the need to answer the call of God, because if every one of God's people who God called actually answered the call, well, that's not true. God does not need everybody who he's called to answer the call. He would like everybody who he's called to answer the call. But God doesn't need a physical majority of people. God just needs a believing, faithful remnant. That's all he needs. 
and we've gone over that before, a dedicated minority for good or evil, historically, anywhere between 7 to 10% of any given population in history, whatever they're dedicated to, evil, like a communist revolution, or if they're dedicated to revival and a great awakening, it only takes a dedicated minority to prevail over the majority. Now, that's the case in communist revolutions where they only had 7 or 8% of the people, but they turned, I mean, that they turned the tide. But it's also true in times of revival and great awakening when there's just a small amount of believing Christians who were faithful, a faithful remnant, and they turned the tide spiritually in our nation. And if you read the Bible over and over again, we don't see stories about uh, how God's people had the, the biggest armies and the biggest everything. No, in most of the accounts in the Bible, there are some exceptions, but in most of the accounts of the Bible, God's people were outnumbered significantly. With David, it was one against Goliath and the entire Philistine army. And there's many other accounts that are somewhat similar in nature. A dedicated minority. That's what God uses. Because you see, God is not interested. That's a world system thing. God's not just interested in a whole bunch of people showing up that don't have the love of the Lord. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them. They can't, what their prayers won't do anything anyway. <laughs> they won't do anything. Okay? So, now, let's talk about this thing. Because you see... <laughs> Depending upon what happens, um, I believe that uh, God calls every president to do certain things for him, and I'm not sure that every president obeys. But we do know this, every president is human. And we need to pray for our president and our elected leaders because it's a spiritual attack. And the enemy has a plan for America. The enemy has wrote, written about his plan out in the open. I mean, if you want to see it, I, I take the various plans of the enemy, and that sounds somewhat confusing. I'll try to explain it. So in my books, for example, I'll, I'll quote the, the bullet points of the Illuminati Manifesto in, in one book. Or in another book, I'll, I'll give you the outline of the Communist Manifesto. Or in another book, I'll give you the outline of uh, this, the, the occult, Alice Bailey and the Plan. Uh, the satanic uh, hierarchy, which uh, operates within the highest power structures of the United Nations, and give you their bullet points. And after a while, you begin to see there's differences, but also uh, many similarities between the goals of, let's just say, all these anti-Christian, anti-American groups that want to destroy America and Christianity. They all have common goals because their source even though uh, one could be called communism or Marxism or socialism, or one is national socialism, which is Nazism, or one is Alice Bailey and the plan, or one is um, this group or that group, the Illuminati, or the, the, the tenets of the French Revolution. Um, you notice that it boils down to the same, essentially the same bullet points. First and foremost, it's always in their goal. Destroy Christianity. And when they're talking about America, destroy Christianity from America. Destroy the Christian family. Destroy the Christian marriage. Destroy Christian values. And destroy patriotism and a belief in nas uh, uh, national sovereignty. Those are, those are really the top bullet points because they understand that if they can smash those things and then they, they have a whole very clearly thought out strategy how to smash those things. And usually it's through psychological, uh, scientific psychological warfare of various means along with spiritual warfare. So... In order to be educated, you have to know your enemy and what your enemy is up to. And you have to know the power that you have and the power that God's given you to defeat your enemy. 
So in my books, I prepare people and educate people and equip people to understand, but also how to embark on a victorious plan of action and and learn how to think supernaturally and act supernaturally. So, for example, in the day the dollar died, I talk about what many of you know, but a lot of people have no idea that our monetary system is not our monetary system. That international bankers, many of them who are heads up in the Illuminati, seized control of the U.S. monetary system in 1913. And we have no control over it. Your average American has no idea that that's the truth. And they need to know. I explain, for example, in the brand new book, Conquering the Matrix, the fact that, that it was the intentional plan by very high-level psychiatrists, scientists, physicists. Many of them came from Nazi Germany. Many of them came here in the United States. But their, their, their common strategy was to alter the fundamental nature of the reality that you and I live in. In other words, you and I here in America and other nations, we live in a physical reality that we perceive with our senses. And at least decades ago, we were all to one degree uh, to another um, uh, educated in a belief in patriotism and a belief in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and either Judaism or Christianity. And that was the common consensus, by the way. And then the attack came. And most people don't even realize that the attack came, and it has kept coming. We're very, very powerful individuals who have openly, when you read the research that I've gathered for you to read in my various books, you read that these individuals, as disconcerting and as shocking as it is, these individuals uh, made a pact with Lucifer and, 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 and chose to follow Lucifer's instructions. And I'm talking about some of the wealthiest men and wealthiest families in the world. And you say, well, how could they possibly be Luciferian? I understand that, that question. I, mean, I, I ask myself the same question many times. How could they possibly be Luciferian? But the more you read about what they've done, and, and, and it's one thing to read about their spiritual beliefs, where you can see a record, which I give you in the books, of their participation and their financing of and their adherence to worshiping Satan and Luciferianism at the United Nations and other groups. Or there's clear documentation of that. It's one thing to see that. But then when you see what their actions are, these, these are the most powerful families in the world. But you see that their actions, and they met, they were all globalists, the elite occult globalists. You see that their, 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 their actions, at first you say, how could anybody do this? Because they, they're, they're guilty of atrocities, by the way, of atrocities. It's just they have so much money and power that uh, I don't know what will be done until Jesus comes. And this is what Trump is on, up against, by the way. They um, are so powerful that they're basically, for the most part, untouchable. So when you ask yourself the question, how could anybody of a conscience, how could any normal human being with that kind of money and power, how could they give the order which they have, maybe not directly, but indirectly, they've given the order to, to let's just say what it is, kill off 6.5 billion people from planet Earth as soon as possible and uh, leave a remaining 500 million people on planet Earth because that's the number they believe is sustainable. Okay? And you realize that they are actively involved behind the scenes in producing uh, pharmaceutical chem uh, chemicals that kill. Uh, 
using toxins and poisonous chemicals in the atmosphere under the pretense. You see, it's always, there's always an excuse for why they do it. That's always good and benevolent. Let's just talk about one thing. Well, let's talk about two things right here. Let's talk about truth. Truth that you won't hear in most churches, because most churches don't want to, want to talk about truth. They want to talk about safe truth, and safe truth is important. But they don't want to apply the truth to, to reality, because then that means they may actually have to do something. Sorry if that rocks your religious world, but it has to be rocked, because I'm interested in obeying Jesus Christ. I'm not interested in playing church. I want to tell you something. I, I did not get saved miraculously by Jesus Christ. I, I no, excuse me, that, that, that doesn't sound right. I did get saved miraculously by Jesus Christ. But, but let me give you just a brief recap of how that happened. I had hair down my waist at the University of Missouri. Grew up in an atheist family in New York City. I was deeply involved in the New Age movement, psychedelic drugs, the whole thing. From a scientific perspective, I was involved in radical politics at the age of 15. Made an honorary member of the Black Panther Party demonstrated with the radical activists when the environmentalist movement first took off. I was there. And, and you know, you're talking 15, 16 years old. And then I majored in filmmaking and altered states of consciousness at the University of Missouri, which was part of the field in the psychology department. Now, I hated Christians with a passion. I grew up in an atheist household in New York City. Went to the University of Missouri. Somebody invited me to a Christian religious retreat where they told me I would get answers. So this, this denominational retreat, an hour outside of the campus of the University of Missouri, in the middle of nowhere but cornfields. And I got there, and it was a bunch of fraternity guys and sorority girls, you know, making out. And literally, I'm telling you, this is not a joke. They were playing spin the bottle and kissing one another. And I, 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 I tried, you know, I, they didn't really like me because I had long hair. I, I tried, and I said, you know, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I have people skills. I'm good at initiating a conversation. I said, I made several approaches, but are, are, are we here to talk about God and spirituality? And they looked at me like I was nuts. And I said to myself, you know what, I really don't need to be here. Because if I want to party, I'm not going to party like, 1950s style and play spin the bottle. I'm at a party like New York City style, you know, where, you know what I'm talking about, where, where you get down to everything. You, do you understand what I'm saying? I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to play this stupid Christian game. If I'm going to sin, I'm going to sin 100%. And if I'm going to live for God, I'm going to live 100%. Real simple. So I told the guy who invited me, I, I got to get out of here. And then miraculously, I was saved hitchhiking, hitchhiking in the back roads of Missouri. I was miraculously saved in a field of dreams type of experience. But notice this. This is the important part. I was saved fleeing, not attending, fleeing a denominational Christian religious retreat. Because I couldn't find truth in the denominational Christian religious retreat. I had to flee for my life like I was fleeing Sodom and Gomorrah, and God saved me in the process of fleeing organized religion. Now, I don't think for one moment that the way that that played out, God did not have his hand in that, because in my very testimony of salvation, the way it actually plays out projects a very loud and clear message, and, and you all know what, what the message is. So, I'm not interested in playing church. I'm interested in talking about the truth. So we have a situation in America. We, we've come to a clear marker in the road. That's what you have to understand. Certain situations, you know, we've postponed them for years by the grace of God. But now it's time to deal, deal with it. If Trump is removed from office through some kind of illegal means. And they will claim it's legal, but it'll be illegal. You're going to see a rapid deterioration of America. And I don't want to get into specifics, but you're going to see the mask is going to come off. Let's just put it that way. 
Now, one would think, I'm not trying to instill fear, by the way, one would think that one would be motivated, your average Christian would be motivated, if, 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 the, if the Holy Spirit calling you does not elicit a response from you, one would think that you would be motivated by your own sense of self-survival if you love your family and your kids and your grandkids, because if you don't act wisely and intelligently, you're not going to want to live in this nation in the near future because the monster is going to come after us. And you know who the monster is. You've seen the monster's eyes. I don't have to explain it to you. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So that hasn't happened yet. We have a window of time, a window of opportunity. But we have to, in addition to responding to the Holy Spirit, we have to think with the mind of Christ. We have to have his wisdom. And we have to be strategic and effective. Now, what is attempting to occur is an illegal coup, a violation of the Constitution. What you're seeing is a power play in which the forces of totalitarianism are attempting to, I mean, they're very powerful. They're, they're attempting to use brute totalitarian force to overthrow a man simply because he's opposed to the globalist agenda and simply because he wants to see America become great again and simply because he supports Christian values. For that, they, they want him out. Because, you see, the vast majority of our politicians on both sides of the are sold out to the globalists. It's totally sold out, man. They, they know it. They're sold out. So, what am I trying to say? I've devoted my life, by the way, my life, and life does not go on forever. I have devoted my life to this. I didn't know I was devoting my life to it. I want you to know that. Not like I had this plan from childhood. But everything in my life fits together like puzzle piece of somebody incredibly brilliant who planned it, and believe me, it wasn't me. And I have been called here for such a time as this. And I'm here to, to, to share with you that, that it is still possible. I, I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would break through your pessimism, your cynicism, the, the false theological ideas you've picked up along the way that really don't match the Bible, but you think they match the Bible. I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis, the dynamite of God, would obliterate all strongholds that the enemy has erected in your mind and that Jesus Christ would set your mind free. Why? Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. So I ask in Jesus' name that your mind would be freed at this moment of fear and that you would operate in the, the, the mind of power, love, and a sound mind that God has given you. God has given us this window of opportunity, an opportunity for a reprieve, an opportunity for a delay, an opportunity for an extension of time that is contingent and conditional upon our response. That's why when I, I tell you God's calling you, I'm, I'm talking about serious stuff. If we ignore the call of God, he will give us what we want. If we, if we continue to ignore the grace and the unmerited favor of God being demonstrated in this hour and continue to play church and fall asleep, and man, you know, I don't know what to say. We have this time and this hour. If we will seek the face of the Lord individually, it's not that difficult. I'm not talking about climbing uh, the Himalayan mountains. It's not that hard. It's simply coming before God, being honest, and asking him for his help, and then participating in what God is doing. When God calls you to do something, quit the fake excuses and come clean and obey the Lord. That's radical. It shouldn't be radical obedience, but in America, we're going to call it radical obedience. And I'm telling you, that if God's people 
will seek his face passionately and to begin to pray for this nation, both Republicans and Democrats, and begin to pray for our president and for the supernatural protection over our president. And if we begin to pray fervently that the powers of darkness are bound over the White House and other areas, and if we really get serious with God, we will go, we will, be, we will by faith be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we will come boldly into the throne of grace to find an ever present help in time of need. And then in the privacy of the throne room of God, where it's just us and God, we worship God and we ask Him. And Christ, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, He has the power to dislodge handcuff, apprehend, strike down territorial spirits because we are dealing with a high-level confrontation of high-level spirits. And all these things are that you're seeing right now uh, are manifestations of that. There have been powerful demonic spirits that rule over geographic centers in the United States, especially media and Washington, D.C., and areas like that. And they've been given permission to gain access because of the disobedience and sin, not by pointing the finger of sinners, which is a repugnant act of self-righteousness and biblically wrong. They have been given permission, because remember, whatever you bind or loose, that's permitting or not permitting. When God's people fail to use the keys of the kingdom, that is permitting the enemy to come in. What would be the reason that God's people would fail to, to prevent the enemy from coming in? That they've, lost, that they've lost the truth and sense of who they are in the body of Christ, that they're playing church rather than being the church. So the real problem is not this group or that group that Christians love to point their fingers at, no, the finger goes to your heart and my heart. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. We repent, and when we repent, the power of God will flow with tremendous force. I'm talking about with seismic force. There will be a shaking. There will be a conflict between high-level demonic and angelic powers. The conflict will be manifest in the visible realm. And if you're clothed with power from on high, God will protect you. He will meet your needs physically and spiritually. His angelic armies will be released to watch about you. And we will prevail in this particular spiritual battle. It's a winnable spiritual war. It's doable. Please, stop being frightened by the intimidating voice of Goliath. That's, that's right from my heart to you. This is, I'm Paul McGuire. Many of you know me. Maybe some of you are new. I'm just sitting in the chair in my studio talking to you, and I just want to tell you this. Flat out, I'm looking in your face, and I want to tell you, stop being afraid of Goliath. And I'm going to say it again. Stop for crying out loud. Stop being afraid of Goliath. Ask God to anoint you with the Holy Spirit when you're anointed with the Holy Spirit, only if God tells you, but you can do it privately in prayer. I wouldn't suggest going out in the street doing it. And you say to Goliath, with wisdom and in the proper environment, you say to Goliath, the equivalent of what David said, which is, how dare you defy the armies of the living God? You see, the church is passive, feminine, feminine and weak for the most part. Not all of it. There's many mighty men of God, but they're the minority. And the church, the world does not respect uh, weak, cowardly, indecisive Christian males. They don't respect them. I'm not talking about being an alpha male. I'm not talking about macho behavior. That, that's fake stuff. I'm talking about 
having the power of God operate in your life. And you see, when the power of God operates in your life, it affects a man and a woman's personality. So, what is happening is happening because we're allowing it by not binding it. And we're not binding it because we don't believe the Word of God. And unbelief in the Word of God releases a curse. It's really that simple. I wish I could tell you it was highly complex, but it's not highly complex. That's it. That's it. That's how we do it. So, we know what's going on. We've heard the call of God. And now we need to obey the call. For some of you, that means coming to the Paradise Mountain Church meeting coming up Thursday, October 24th, uh, August 24th on Thursday. The directions in North Hollywood, the directions, you've got to register, it's free. The directions, instructions, and all that stuff are on the website, paulmcguire.us. And we'll pray, and I have a prophetic message that the Lord has given me to give you. And we will pray, and we will believe God, and we will do exactly what God told us to do in his word. And there will be a time of ministry. But you know what? It never ceases to amaze me <clears throat> how often people can resist the call of the Spirit of God. <clears throat> but it doesn't bother me because... It doesn't matter. Um, I mean, the numbers is not what determines the result. The Lord showed me that in his word a long time ago. The numbers, he says it over and over again. See, that's, that's a worldly thinking. Numbers do not necessarily equate power. They can. But what is more important than numbers is who is there, and what is their relationship with Jesus Christ like? That's where the power is. That's where the Lord shows up. So we need to, to rise in the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit and intercede for our president and supernaturally protect him so that this coup cannot happen, so that it is dismantled, so that the angelic armies are released to protect the president, and so that as we enter the throne room of God, the principalities and powers are broken and paralyzed because ultimately this is a spiritual warfare that has deep and far-ranging prophetic implications that go right into the heart of the one world government, the one world economic system, and the one world religion that is prophesied throughout the Bible, especially in Genesis 11. It goes directly into that territory. That's what we're dealing with. And we're not going to undo that. Make no mistake about it. That's going to happen. But you need to understand something. John 3.16 tells us something about God. God is love. He's righteous. He's holy. He's just. But God is love. And in John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believeth on him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. It is the will of God before the tribulation period begins. It is the will of God before the wrath of God begins. It's the will of God before the Antichrist starts having the false prophet force people to accept the mark of the beast. It is the will of God that as many people as will come to receive Christ's free offer of salvation will come. It's the final casting of the net. It's the final last days, the great last days soul harvest. It's, it, the fields are white with harvest and the laborers are few. But in order for that harvest to be reaped, there has to be a structure. There has to be a nation with, which has some kind of freedom, some kind of economy, and some kind of uh, wherewithal and ability 
to bring in the last day's soul harvest. And that nation right now is America. There's no, no other nation that can do it. That doesn't mean America's all that great. God could choose another nation, but at the present moment, America is, is what he would like to use to bring in the last day's soul harvest. So that means we have a, a job uh, in terms of winning a spiritual warfare so that the last day soul harvest can be brought in. And that entails other things. The igniting of a biblical revival, the igniting of a Jesus movement, a total shifting in, in the spiritual uh, system that is operating in the invisible realm above us, a total breaking and dismantling of high-level principalities and powers, and the, uh, the replacement with God's highest ranking angels. You see, all of that is playing out simultaneously with what's going on in the White House. And some of you have, some of you have not been alive long enough. Some of you were not there when the Jesus movement revival occurred. And you don't know what it's like to experience the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of God in raw revival. I'm talking about raw revival. When the power of the Holy Spirit comes down, man, through ordinary people, and, and, and God moves, and he smashes doors open, and, and people just get saved, and nothing can stop it. Some of you need to get into that. You need, you, you need to catch the, the current. So, what's the game plan? The game plan is this. God has called you, both men and women, and he's called you for a multiplicity of purposes. And your job is to do what, the best that you can in being faithful to what he's called you to do. And none of us are perfect, including me. But we ask God for forgiveness, and we, we continue on. And in the process of being faithful, the peace of the Lord that passes all understanding begins to minister to our hearts and souls. The peace of God that passes all understanding begins to be poured out in our hearts, our minds, our households, our marriages, our jobs, our children, and our commutes. Do you understand what that means? When you listen really carefully, because this is like I'm giving you a million dollars in a suitcase and I didn't get it from Columbia and I don't sell cocaine. This is worth a lot of money. If you will answer the call of God, and part of me wants to laugh and joy, if you, if, if you will answer the call of God, guess what will happen? The Lord will be so pleased with your step of obedience, however imperfect. He will be so pleased with you that as a proof to you, because some of you want proof and God's delighted to give you proof, as a proof to you that, that he heard your prayer, he's going to begin to pour out his joy and his peace and his blessing on your life. But it's peace. And what's going to happen is you're going to Recognize that as you pursue and are obedient to the call that he issued you, to you, you're going to notice it because it kind of sneaks up on you. It doesn't usually happen like, well, maybe it'll happen suddenly. I don't know. But, the, but you know, it maybe a couple of days goes by, a couple of weeks go by, and you're attempting to answer the call of God. And then all of a sudden you know that the peace of God and the presence of God is being poured out where you live. It's being poured out in your, your job. It's being poured out in, in relationships which were like strained. And, and, and then you start to experience joy because you're not carrying all these burdens. You're saying, and you, you pause to reflect and you say, well, what happened? Something's different. Maybe you really haven't grasped what's different yet. But then it dawns upon you that, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling peace like I haven't felt it before. I'm feeling the presence of the Lord like I haven't felt it before. I'm feeling the joy of the Lord like I haven't felt it before. Then you begin to realize that, hey, it is possible to walk under this thing that Paul was talking about on his radio program. I mean, 
there's something there's there's something to it because I'm experiencing it. And that's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. You see what happened? <laughs> you accidentally entered a doorway where you entered a doorway where you're now living in the secret place of the Most High. You're living under the shadow of the Almighty. And under his wings, you'll find rest. You see, you didn't even know what was happening when you answered that call. You just did it. Maybe it kind of bugged you to do it, but you did it. But the next thing that happened, you just walked through a doorway that God knew was there. And I don't know if you knew it was there. But when you walked through that doorway, you entered a room. And where did that room lead you to? It led you back into the same reality that you were in, but your reality was changed. You can now feel the presence of the Lord and the peace of the Lord and the joy of the Lord. That's where that door took you. And if you do that, like a little child, you'll end up with a big smile on your face and a supreme confidence because the peace of God that passes all understanding and guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Um, you know, there's no words to describe that. It's like the presence of the Lord can be so incredibly strong. But in the presence of the Lord is beauty, glory, holiness, purity, healing, faith, hope, joy, answers to prayer, and the goodness of God, and the goodness of God. And it's wonderful. And so you, you press on, and you do what the Lord tells you to do. And you won't do it perfectly. I don't do it perfectly. But you're faithful. That's all. You're faithful. And faithfulness, faithfulness does not mean you're perfect. Faithful means you're faithful. And in that faithfulness, and in your willingness to respond to the call of the Lord, you will find yourself in a very important place. You will find yourself in the place that you were called to be in before the beginning of time, when God knew you before the foundation of the world. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. By the way, I want to invite you, and I want you to answer the call of the Lord, to join us at Paradise Mountain Church meeting, where I'll be giving a special uh, prophetic message and one that is tied into what's happening in our nation. We'll worship the Lord together. We will pray. Um, we will minister to everybody who's there, and I will be personally available to pray for every person who desires to be prayed for. And uh, we, when you come there, you will experience the presence of the Lord and the joy of the Lord. God moves, and God also moves miraculously. And we're there to do uh, kingdom business, but God is there to do kingdom business in your life and release you and bless you and breathe his life and his joy and his anointing and his power upon you. And some of you need that. And, you know, I'm not claiming to be Jesus. I figured that out a long time ago. But who, who got healed when Jesus was around? It was the people that pressed in like that lady who pressed through the crowd to touch the hem of Je the hem of Jesus's garment. She had to kind of like press through the crowd, but she was hungry for God. And so when she touched the hem of his garment, she was healed. And, and Jesus turned around because he could be, feel the virtue of God going out of him. Now, again, I'm not here to infer that I'm Jesus because I'm certainly not. But I, what I'm trying to illustrate to you is that God, it is a kingdom principle, God rewards those who diligently seek him. 
And you know what I mean. That means you've got to press into Jesus to, to receive Jesus. If you're not hungry enough for God to, to, to do anything to, to get God, you're not going to get God. That, I mean, for crying out loud, the guy was so hungry to, for the Lord to be healed that he had his friends crash through the roof of this house. So, according to your faith, be it unto you. I'd love to see you there, and you'll be greeted with love and acceptance. By the way, back to this spiritual battle, and, and this is the mandate, the bigger mandate. It is very disturbing to me of what I'm seeing on the Internet, because every day I probably spend a minimum, and I, you know what, I really am getting tired of doing this, but I spend about a minimum of six hours researching on the Internet and as I've said before, I am noticing a growing and very alarming trend. And that is that the major, all, I don't want to name the names for obvious reasons, but all the big social media giants and the tech companies, the search engine companies and all the other ones that we all know and we all use, they are using very sophisticated computers. I don't think they have staffs of people doing it. And what they're doing is they're censoring, they're deleting, they're burying, they're lowering, they're lowering uh, this person or that group in rankings, and they're elevating this person or that group in rankings. They're manipulating the count of watches and hits and visits and listens. They're rigging the entire internet, and it's becoming more and more obvious. And they're doing it for a number of reasons. Those websites that are called alternative right, which are telling the truth for the most part. They want to smash them out of existence. They want to bury them because they, there's so many people going to them. So, so the most strategic way to get rid of them is to impact negatively their advertising dollars, which are based on how many hits or clicks they get. So what they're doing is, is they're artificially rigging the Internet so it causes people not to find these alternative rights, uh, not alternative right, alternative media uh, news sites and Christian sites and anything they de deem is not politically correct. Somebody got punished huge for, I don't know, some, saying something moderately positive. Oh, it was Twitter. Twitter, Twitter uh, um, censored one of Donald Tr Trump's sons were saying something positive about his father's economic policy. They actually censored his, his tweet. But, but, but that's, like, that's like nothing. This is, this is very pervasive. And you need to really start speaking up and protesting. Not in just the chat rooms. You need to let these companies know. You need to expose them. Because they are, they are, they are controlling our society by controlling the Internet. And they're doing it in, a, in, in the most unethical, unfair, and, and manipulative way. And it's really evil. I can't tell you how many articles I can't go to anymore. There'll be an interesting article posted on websites that you and I might both know, and I can't go to the article because when I click it, now mysteriously it says there's an error message, this page is missing, and all this phony baloney stuff that I don't believe for one minute because six months ago I never got these error messages. They're censoring the internet, and they're and and see, I can, I don't want to. Well, let's put it this way: it used to be when I would go to, a, I used to use the largest search engine in the nation. You know what I'm talking about. I'm now looking for another one because I politically can't take it. I can't take my my uh, what what do you call it? My email company because every time I open my my emails, I have to look at this propaganda attacking what I believe in, in my face. And I've had it. I'm going to, I'm, I will, even, I know, I will make sure, and I know how to do this, and you, you can figure it out too. There are ways that you can look up the actual email accounts of the top executives. Now, sometimes they're, they're clever. They block the main CEO. But you can get an executive vice president and stuff, and it should be a polite, co coherent email telling them you're no longer to be, be using their search engine and, and, and briefly explaining why. But it has to get to the top people or nothing will happen. 
because they're censoring it, they're rigging it. So things that I look up disappear. Uh, the mainstream media, really important stories. I can't find them there. Fox News is 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 not Fox News anymore. They just censor stuff like crazy. I feel like I'm watching CNN in the early days. So we have to respond to that. In any case, despite all the challenges of the Internet, there are new technologies being raised up. And there are strategies that can be implemented to do an end run around uh, this, this censorship mechanism. And there's new technologies that you can use that can enable you to get your message to millions of people and not allow uh, yourself to be censored. I mean, it was a tragedy. I forgot the guy's name. He's the head of a, 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 a big news internet website uh, called Natural News, which has good stuff on health and stuff. And he wrote something uh, negative about vaccinations. And I think they pulled his website down or something really huge for daring to publish something that has been uh, uh, people have raised questions about. I think it may have had to do with the potential relationship between autism and vaccinations or something. So, you know, they're waging war of censorship. But we still have plenty of opportunities, and thank God technology is constantly changing. So new avenues of communication are being raised up even as we speak. But we got to move fast. So again, we're in a war for the hearts and minds and souls of mankind and this nation. And that means we need to use the, the communication weapons at our disposal because we're trying to win hearts and minds and souls. And that means doing it the most effective way. We reach huge numbers of millions of people every six months for a variety of reasons. But we can multiply, I mean, just just blow it through the roof, the amount of people we reach if we begin to televise and get up and running the broadcast quality studio because there are so many people, probably the majority of people that are visually oriented. If we can present our mes message with visuals and videos and use social media broadcasting, and I'm not worried about the people that are shutting things down because there's new ones coming on board that are opening things up. Um, if we can get out our message, the uh, television, enhanced social media, using different social media, using the television channels we've already acquired, but we're ready to, we, we need to get the funding to uh, get the programming put up there and edited, etc. If we can use the media that God has given us and utilize broadcast television and the editing and the studios and multiple cameras and all the technology, which is affordable, it's not some outrageous price, we need to raise an immediate $100,000. That may sound like a lot of money to some of you, but I'm telling you, it is nothing in comparison to what most people spend and what $100,000 will give you today would, be, would have been what $5 million would have gotten you about five years ago. That's how much, how much lower and affordable things are, and yet you get the same quality. So we, we want to be as competitive as possible. We want to live stream from the church services, the prophecy teachings, the conferences. We want to make it available on multiple channels multiple platforms of broadcasting. And the reason for that is it's a strategic move. If, if so-and-so, you know, this uh, search engine or this social media giant decides to get, uh, to, to get rid of all Christian content, well, then so what? We're on 25 other different platforms. You see what I'm saying? But that takes technology. It takes hiring uh, qualified part-time staff um, so that we can do that. In addition, we want to uh, continue to produce articles, special videos. A lot of the stuff that I talk about is somewhat complex. I want people to be able to get it like as fast as possible. 
So I'm asking you to pray for our ministry because this war of communications is the primary physical manifestation of the spiritual battle war involved in. I hope you understand that. The primary manifestation of the spiritual conflict that we're involved in, primary battle is in the spiritual realm, but in the physical realm, the primary battle is in the hearts and minds of men. Well, what then is it that allows us to win the hearts and minds of men and women? What allows us to uh, remove darkness and and put in the, the light of God's truth. What allows us to win souls? Well, in today's world, it's computer social media, it's the internet, it's cell phones, it's laptops, it's uh, broadcast channels, broadcasting on social media, it's television, it's radio, it's a, it's a synergistic combination of all those technologies being used properly. When we do that, then, and if, but, but you see, in order to win, we have to be out there in the conflict. We have, to be, we have to be there in the enemy's territory. It's not enough to be just surrounded by religious stuff. You have to have your programming right in the middle of areas that the people that need to hear it most can view it. And we're ready to do that, but I, I need your help. So I'm asking you to go to the Lord and pray, um, answer the call that God has put on your life, and whatever God tells you to do, obey him. And uh, if he gives you a, an amount to give or donate financially, then obey him. You understand what we're trying to do. It, it will work. It has worked. By God's grace, I've done this Numerous times I've gone from zero to a particular goal, but I had to establish from the ground floor up uh, on numerous programs, and I won't go into the past, the Paul McGuire show and other things. So this is not something new to me. We've done it many times before, and we can do it again. But this time, we can do it. You know, it's not like the old days, producing a feature film, millions and millions of dollars you had to raise. It took forever with this technology, it's like, it's so inexpensive, comparatively speaking. So, with your partnership, we can win this war. All we have to do is influence and change the hearts and minds of a particular percentage of people in certain areas, and we, along with the, the, the few and exceptional other ministries that are doing similar things, we can change the direction of the spiritual battle. And then when we mobilize people to pray, we're, we're reaching people instantly. And we're calling large numbers of people to engage in real spiritual warfare because we believe in the supernatural power of God. We believe in uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not here to criticize anybody, but uh, some of my brothers and sisters in the Lord they love the Lord. They, they may even be better Christians than I am. I don't know. But I'm telling you, I think that some of them are missing out on all of the resources that God has given us at his disposal. I'm talking about the supernatural resources. Because you see, the church and Christians, we, can, we will never win the battle if we are using the world's weapons of warfare that's why David chose not to pick up the armor of Saul. It was the most expensive and best military armor and sword you could get. But he rejected the armor of Saul, even though it was the best armor that, that could enable you to win against an opponent. Because he went into battle fighting Goliath with his slingshot and a stone. Why? Because under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, his effectiveness came to fruition based on what God called him to do under the power of God versus relying on worldly methods of strength. With, with, and with all their worldly methods of strength, King Saul was paralyzed with fear and the armies of Israel were paralyzed with fear. So we want to incorporate 
in, in addition to technology and being available on every platform, we want to incorporate with integrity the supernatural power of God. So I'm asking you to go to the Lord in prayer and simply ask the Lord, how can I help? How can I stand with Paul on a regular basis? How can I come alongside him and partner with him in this spiritual battle? And for those of you that feel led to um, be ongoing uh, intercessors, spiritual warriors, and pray for me, my family, and the ministry, your participation is absolutely essential because we cannot, none of us, including me, none of us can win this spiritual battle alone. We are part of the body of Christ. Each one of us are a part of the body of Christ. And that is a supernatural body. And each one of us have a particular role to play in the body of Christ. And there's no, you know, favored position in the eyes of Jesus. But if each one of us are faithful as individual members of the body of Christ to do what we are called individually to do, then we can do what the body of Christ ultimately was called to do in the last days by Jesus, which is the body of Christ has been given the supernatural authority to tread upon the scorpions and serpents. Now, there's uh, uh, scorpions and serpents all over the land of America, all over the people of God's lives, all over Washington, D.C. What are these scorpions and serpents? They represent the demonic powers. When the body of Christ is operating supernaturally, the way God called it to, then the feet of the body of Christ, which represents the authority of the body of Christ, can tread, that means stomp, trample, destroy. When you step on, you're ex exercising authority over the serpents and the demonic powers, and you're paralyzing them and destroying them. But you're doing so because Jesus, who's the head of the body of Christ, is directing every member. But here's the important part. Every member must obey their call. And God issues the call, and then you have a choice whether or not you want to obey it. But always remember that at the end of the day, you will be accountable, as I will be, for how faithfully I obeyed the call and the directives that God gave me. Because I will, as you will, stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And at that time, for each one of us who have been faithful, we will be rewarded. And that will be taken with us um, into heaven. So that's the, the good news. And the other part of the good news is nothing is impossible with God. And I believe God has called us for such a time as this. I believe with all my heart, or I wouldn't be sitting up here doing this day after day. I believe with all my heart that this is a winnable war. Even in this hour of crisis, I believe this is a winnable war. And I believe that at, that with an instantaneous strike force of the Holy Spirit, that God is poised and ready to confuse the enemies of Christ, throw them into confusion, paralyze their dark and sinister plans, and break the spirit of Antichrist that drives them. I believe that. I believe that. And I hope you do too. God bless you. I'm your brother in Christ, Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us.